My name's Chris McDowell. Uh, yeah, I've had a pretty weird... Oh, I should look at what the time is so that I know how long to speak for. There we go. Uh, great. Um, yeah, I've had a pretty weird career. Uh, I've worked a lot of different places in, in several different roles, um, uh, including Manaki Whenua Lanky Research, and, and I've even worked actually in this building uh, as I worked for the, as the technical manager for the Digital New Zealand Project for National Library of New Zealand. Um, but these days when I'm asked to um, fill out my profession on some sort of official government form, I just usually write geographer. Um, I, I freelance on a bunch of projects, big and small, and usually what I'm trying to do is help people um, uh, make sense of data, usually trying to communicate data in some way. Um, my my co-author, Tim, unfortunately, he was going to be presenting with me. Uh, he's had a, um, a, a family situation, and so unfortunately, Tim can't be here today. So um, I'm going to try and do justice to Tim's work, um, but it might be a little bit more heavy on some of the technical aspects and a little lighter on some of the graphic design aspects that Tim was going to talk about. So, oh right, it's uh, not this laptop. So yeah, we made a book, um, and we made a book with almost entirely open source software, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. Um, it was a five-year project, and most of the work took place really in the last two years. So we were working, both of us working sort of nights and weekends for most of the time, um, and right towards the end, I sort of took a bunch of time off and just was dedicated on it. What it is, it's an atlas of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, there's 87 spreads. Uh, the majority are maps, but not all are maps. It's a, there are a lot of data visualizations, um, non-geographic data visualizations in there as well. And it's spread across eight different chapters. So Te Whenua, Air and Water, Living Things, Places, People, Government, Movement and Energy, Heart and Memory. And I'm not really going to talk about the content of the book in this particular talk. Um, what I'm going to talk about really is three different things, um, and most heavily the third of the three things I'm about to say. I'm going to talk about our general collaboration process, like how, how Tim and I work together. Um, I'm going to talk about the tools that we used, and I'm also then just going to spend most of the time detailing the creation of three specific maps. So... There's a whole talk that Tim and I could give about establishing and coordinating our mahi, but um, to ensure that I give enough time to the maps themselves, I'm just going to touch on one aspect of this. So um, in terms of project managing something like this, we, we had a lot of false starts. Um, we tried doing stuff with Google Docs. We tried creating these like elaborate shared spreadsheets. And in the end, we just um, managed the whole book with a couple of Trello boards. And most of the time, it was a single Trello board. Um, and so this is Trello. It's a um, piece of software that was a recently acquired by... Um, and so for most of the project, we used a, a modified Kanban board. Um, this is not it. This is the second board that I'll get to. Um, and basically, we just had a Kanban board where every page was a spread, and we had stuff which was not started, Chris in progress, ready for Tim, Tim in progress, review, and done. And that was it. That was how we project managed the whole thing. Um, later, I introduced a second Trello board, which is what you see here. And we use this to actually organize the book structure. And so here, every column is a chapter, and... Um, every uh, card is a different spread of the book. And it was just great being able to like, have this shared view onto the project. Um, there's a whole lot of other stuff I could say about project management and a project like this, but I'm sort of just going to go deep into the technical sides of things. Um, I'll just make one note that Trello can be a little bit unwieldy, um, especially if there's a lack of clarity around what constitutes a card or poor discipline in maintaining boards. Um, but I think that's, <laughs> that goes with pretty much any project management software that you could talk about. For us, it was perfect, and it was this shared view um, of progress on a visual project. Um, this, this slide shows the major tools that we use to create the book spreads. Uh, it's a simplification. There were lots of other little bits and pieces along the way, but this is the core of what we used. And there's sort of two different primary paths through it. So most of the spreads, well, all the spreads sort of started on the left-hand side in preparation, moved through a kind of like sketching, visualization, rendering stage, and then eventually getting ready for print presentation. Um, and the only non-open source software up there is, is in that print presentation where we were using uh, both Adobe Illustrator, and it's not there, but also Adobe InDesign for, um, for the print production. 
Um, but in terms of the rest, um, there were sort of these two primary paths. Uh, generally, um, I started off needing to clean data or manipulate it or transform it in some way. And usually that was um, using Python, um, either pure Python or Python with some other, like say GDAL bindings or something like that. Um, and then it would move into one of three environments for, for the actual visualization. Um, most of the maps were made with QGIS. Um, nearly all of the maps were made with QGIS. Um, some of the unusual non-geographic data visualizations um, were created with d3.js. Um, and the trickier maps, um, one of which is going to be the first example I talk about, was actually created by coming up with style, styling rules in TileMill and then rendering them with MapNick. And I'm going to step through that process in the first case study. Um, the second primary path was, was sort of the R path, um, where we were using both R and the extended tidyverse. I, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna use a lot of technical terms and I hope that's fine for people. Um, I figure that it's a sort of a technical crowd. If anything's unclear, just come and um, just send me an email and I'll just tell you all about it, it'll be great. Um, uh, so that second primary path was using R and, and the extended tidyverse for, for data preparation as well as the rendering. And we typically use that for more standard sort of charts. We've, we've got some area charts in the book. We've got a few sort of, uh, um, sort of line charts um, and the occasional simple map. And the third case that I discuss today will actually be an example of a, of a map that we made with R. Um, and yeah, in all the cases, we finished off the spread and their layouts with Adobe Illustrator. Um, that's the point where I'd hand it over to Tim. So I'd typically prepare a basic layout in Illustrator, get, the, get the, all of the elements into Illustrator. I typically have the paragraph text, labeling and captioning. And then um, Tim would just come in and do this graphic design magic where uh, he'd do a lot of adjusting of colors, he'd do typographic work, he'd sort of do fine tuning of element layout and all these other really small but vital details that, that elevated um, the final product from something that looked kind of okay into, into something which I think looks much better. Um, Tim's design sense and, and his technical skill just continue to, to astonish me today. So for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna talk about three different spreads. Um, and each is the, the, the chance to sort of discuss some different aspect of either the technical or design process. Um, we don't have time to go too deep, but I hope that this is um, useful in some way. So over two spreads within the book, um, we show all of Aotearoa's national parks ordered from smallest to largest. Um, these maps are based on the Department of Conservation's national park boundaries, Manaki Fenua's uh, land cover database, and also Manaki Fenua's national 25 uh, meter digital elevation model. Um, this is the second sp uh, page of those spreads. Um, the aim was to create something in the spirit of, of one of my cartography heroes, Tom Patterson, of the US National Park Service. Um, I don't think these maps are as good as Tom's, but, but I'm happy enough with them. Um, I neglected to include an example of one of Tom's maps, but if you're unfamiliar with his work, you should, I encourage you to check it out. He's, he's incredible. Um, so explaining how these maps were made actually goes back about a decade or so. Um, sometime in 2010, I read this 2006 thread on, on Kato Talk forum, and it's this pretty interesting discussion about creating naturalistic land cover maps in the style of Tom Patterson. And a few posts in, there's this user called Louie who posts a, um, she writes a post and shares two images um, of the same map which he made with Visual Nature Studio. Um, one of the images shows uh, a map of land cover and um, terrain around, uh, I think it's pronounced like Bohinj uh, in Slovenia. Um, and it's, this, it's an astonishing work. Um, there's, um, the colors are actually a little, funky on, on that projection, um, the, 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 oh, this one looks great down here. Um, th there's a clarity and an, an intuitiveness to this map that I've really seen. It, it's, there's this incredible use of light, shadow, texture and color um, that makes the map um, nuanced and yet intuitive. And I think it's a really incredible piece of work. So I'm gonna zoom in, this is the other thing, just on, on this one portion of the map, and this gives you a sense of the whole thing. Um, it's, a, it's a detail from the eastern portion of Louis' map, and it's an area of farmland and horticultural plantings along a river. 
And you can see these cliffs and these riparian plantings and this sort of effortless distinction between grass and, and woodlands. And there's almost no need for a legend. It just comes across as, as effortless, but it's this really deep and thoughtful piece. Um, and so I've actually studied these images for like 10 years and tried to sort of reverse engineer them. And I, and I don't think I've ever made anything as good as them. But what, what follows is a behind the scenes look of, of the best that I could achieve for the book. So to create our national park maps, we used tile mill um, to create the styling rules. Um, tile mill was, <laughs> I guess, a past tense, um, an amazing open source technology for creating Cardo CSS rules. Um, Cardo CSS being a particular uh, language for, for cartographic styling. Um, I say was because I think it's largely been abandoned. I'm looking at you, Hamish. Is it largely abandoned? Do you know? Oh, okay, that's great. Let's talk about that another time. Awesome, it's, it's been taken up, it's gonna be great. It's, it's, it's a phoenix rising from the ashes. Ish. Um, Say <laughs> uh, la vie. Uh, I, I really like tile mill and I really like Cardo CSS, um, although I do understand why the, the people who created it have moved on to, to other things. Um, but be forewarned, it, it sounds like they're largely unsupported today. So, so the first thing I did was uh, I took the boundary of each national park and then I symbolized it with a, with a native forest style. And it might be a bit hard to tell on the screen, but it's sort of a, there's a bumpy forest texture there. And, and so these are what the Kato um, CSS rules look like for the styling. Um, basically what we've got is a, is a solid green base um, with an image texture overlaid it at 25% transparency multiply blend. Um, you don't need to... I mean, you can photograph this and write it down. Um, this, this is all in a GitHub repo, which I'll just share at the end. So um, you just relax. Um, I, I um, created um, that original image. I can't remember if it was in GIMP or Photoshop, but it's basically a noise filter with a thresholding mask and, and an emboss effect. Um, the next thing I did was, um, so I, I took the base of the, the made all of the um, national park boundaries, this kind of bumpy forest, and then I symbolized all the other land classes. And so you might be thinking, that why didn't I do the indigenous forest at this step? And there's a reason why I did remove the natives from this symbolization. And that's when I'm sketching, I, I think of this as sketching a map. Um, one of the most important things is quick refresh and redraw. Um, so even after geometry simplification, the, the native forest po polygons for, for the national parks have these really complex boundaries. And in contrast, the park boundaries are just, they're just really simple. And so I can render this really fast, like it just boom and it's there. Whereas it just takes like an extra kind of, if I'm actually trying to get the tile mill to render each individual native boundary, it, it's sort of maybe, a three quarters of a second, but it, it just all adds up when you're constantly going save, 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 save. So I'm always looking for the quickest way to, to get a refresh going if, I, if I'm sketching stuff. Um, here's a portion of the styling rules. I mean, it's, these are a combination of solid fills and, um, and textures. Um, I'm not gonna go into them um, apart from to say it, it's, it's very similar to what you saw before. Um, and these are all up if you wanna take a look at them. Um, the next thing that I did was set up a raster colorizer for um, uh, where the um, flat slopes are completely transparent and the 90 degree slopes are sort of a, a dark gray. So this is a slope layer rather than a shaded relief layer. Um, one of the biggest things that I see in, um, in shaded relief mapping is people kind of uniformly applying the shaded relief to the flat areas in the same way that they're applying it to the, shed, to the slopes and stuff. And when you do that, when you blend a black, a black ink in, or, either, or, a, or a kind of like a low value RGB into, the, um, into a, a flat um, color, it kind of gets this muddy look. And so whenever I'm doing shaded relief work, I try and avoid ever altering the flats. Um, and so that's why I've set up this, um, this, this is what the, I mean, you may not be familiar with Cardo CSS, but this is what I'm doing here is basically um, the, the key line is those color rasterizer stops. And so where it's a slope of zero, where it's flat land, it's just totally transparent. There's, I never blend in anything there. And on a 90 degree slope, it's like a dark purple. And I do a color burn um, so that it darkens the underlying image um, while still retaining the hue intensity. Um, 
Finally, I bring in, um, and so the reason I, I treat slopes differently from hill shading is that when you've got fully illuminated hill, hill slopes, you, um, you actually lose a lot of definition, I think, if you're just relying on a shaded relief. Whereas if I flick back and you see these, um, it's a bit hard to see, but there's sort of, it's irrespective of where the sun is shining, there's always a bit of definition on, on those hill slopes. Um, and so I finally bring in um, the, the shaded relief and treat light and shadow differently. So um, what I do with the light and shadow here is um, for, again, anything that has a value of 180 in this case, and, and the 0 to 255 scale for a shaded relief surface, that's flat land. So I make that fully transparent. You don't need to know what these numbers mean. Just know that flat, I sort of try and keep the base color. If it's, um, uh, if it's an illuminated slope, I use a, a yellow kind of like blended fill and use, um, it's down the bottom there, the raster compop, that means I, I lighten it. So I take the lightest color from the, from the, from the yellow light falling on the, onto, the, onto the colored slope. Um, up the top there um, is the shadows. The shadows are like treated totally differently. Instead of using yellows, I'm using purples and, and, um, and like dark, very dark purples and blending that all together. And again, I'm only really um, uh, shadowing with it using a multiply blend, the, the, the darkest of the slopes. Um, Finally, so I kind of like come up with this composite image and tile mill and then export these rules out. And um, the thing with all of these like mapping technologies is that they're just all designed for Web Mercator. Um, how am I going on time? Oh, great. I'm going to be really short. Um, so they're all designed for, for Web Mercator. And Web Mercator is just... It, it's a bit of a crap projection for New Zealand. Um, so one of the things that I did was look for a way of rendering at like high high quality um, in New Zealand transverse Makeda. And so there's this incredible rendering package that's, that's used sort of under the hood of many other mapping technologies called Mapnik. Um, and Mapnik has Python bindings. Um, and so I wrote, um, again, this is all on GitHub, these um, rules for basically taking some rules out of tile mill and then specifying the, the dots per inch that you want, the size of the page and the extent, and then creating these 600 DPI renders, which are what we ended up in the book. Um, finally, Tim did a little bit of um, tinting um, uh, in Photoshop in order to just, we sort of, we both decided that the, that the maps were a bit cool, and so he just warmed them up a bit. But there's actually no reason we couldn't have done this in, at the level of the rules themselves. It was just, we had to get the bloody book to print. Um, <laughs> the second thing that I wanted to talk, and I'll, I'll go through pretty qu quick on this, is just getting design feedback. So at the start of the project, I was really conscious of my, uh, <laughs> five years ago, I was really conscious of my um, tendency to noodle on something. And so I actually set up a small reference group and, and asked people to, to provide a commentary on, um, on the work that I did. So I sent stuff out. And at first I got these amazing, really thoughtful responses. And these were not cartographic practitioners. Um, these were actually just sort of people who kind of muggles, like who like kind of had an interest in maps, but didn't really like know anything about them. And so at first people were writing back and they had these really thoughtful things. And then soon I sort of got, within the fourth round, I think, I'd get these um, emails. Most people wouldn't reply and other people were just like, oh, I'm just too busy. And I remember the fifth round I sent it out and I just got nothing back. And, um, and that was actually really a difficult time because I was like, oh, no, this is all terrible work and it's all a big load of crap and why am I doing this? And so there was sort of about a couple of years there where I almost just didn't show this work to anybody at all. And then I made a change where I started bringing people in and getting people to come to my house and just like invite them over for an afternoon and just run them through stuff. And I learned so much just by putting people in front of maps. I mean, it's very much like user testing in, in, webs, in web work um, where you, you get somebody to, to sit in front of them and, and just observe them with, with a map. And so this is one map. Um, again, it's not great on this projection, um, but we have these lightning maps of, um, these maps are lightning strikes. And these, these words just kept on coming up over and over again. Take the labels off, the place names take away from the map. Do you need places on every map? And so originally this, this map was covered in um, place names. And just from listening to people, we just remove them. And I think it's a much stronger map for that. Um, and there was something in the watching of people that we just learned so much. 
The final one, I'm going to just go through really fast. Um, it's, I'm kind of obsessed with Emma Coates's, um, who used to work at Pixar, her rules for storytelling. And especially this one here. Um, uh, so this is about... I think it can be applied to design, but focus, combine characters, hop over detours, you'll feel like you're losing valuable stuff, but it sets you free. So we had these bird distribution maps, and I was trying to show everything. So I had this one map of all of the birds in New Zealand, and nobody could see anything. And so that's what the raw data looked like. It was just like all of these easting and northings and whether a bird was observed there or not. And so... Um, in the end, what we did was we just looked at certain species. So we just went, okay, well, we'll just look at uh, eight birds and took those eight birds and just mapped those eight birds. And so this is one of the ones that's in R. I don't have time to take you. I was going to take you through the code, and it's going to be so interesting. But um, uh, uh, you can just read it. It's great. Um, it, well, it's not great code. It's just passable. But, like, um, but there's something about actually by focusing on fewer things, I think we can see a lot more. And the thing that blows me away about this map, and this is the last thing I'll say, is um, well, there's two things. One is, <laughs> one is the incredible change that it made when Tim put in those little silhouettes of the, of the birds themselves. And uh, I, there were times where they were actually much more in the foreground and they were kind of more realistic, but, but just by pushing them back and just having the hint of the bird, it actually, I think, really, really helps. And the other was the inclusion of the, the Australasian gannet. Um, more than one person has said, oh, I feel like really dumb saying this, but all those gannets around the coast, because it's a coastal bird, and it's like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. And that map then gave them the confidence to read the, the rest of those maps because I think we overestimate the cartographic literacy of, of people and how unfamiliar and how dumb people can often feel when they're reading a map. Um, and by giving them that, it was this small victory and it, it unlocked the rest of the spread for them. And that's all I'll say. Oh, except um, we put everything, all the code up on GitHub, except for the bits that I haven't put up yet, but I'll put that up really soon. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you. Oh, questions. Fantastic, Chris. Have we got uh, some questions? Mm -hmm. Ooh, lots of hands. Uh, I don't know who to, how to... Oh, great. We're going to do this. Hey, did you, um, did you find that lack of CMYK support in the open source software was an issue for you? Yes, it was a real headache. <laughs> um, so often, yeah, I learned... Uh, yes, it was a real pain in the neck. Um, and so... Um, Yes, Is that, that's, I've got a real long answer, which I could talk to you about later, but I would love to see more CMYK support in open source software, is the short answer. But, oh my God, well, it, that mic's going down? Yeah, it was such a headache, and it's really hard to convert between RGB and CMYK, especially with blacks, and ugh. Hey, um, oh, we are highly utilizing the tell me and Mabnik to generate the tiles, mm. um, but we're building the custom, um, kind of custom open street map for our clients. But we always generate tiles uh, for the web marketer projection. Mm. So, um, but my question is if there is an easy way to generate tiles based on different projections, for example, the NZ team or other ones. Thank so you. It's very easy to create a single very large image in, in a custom projection. But, but we're ju generating the tiles oh, for different zoom levels. And I think it's very difficult to produce the tiles. Is, yeah. Producing, I, I've never tried it. Um, and theoretically, you could do it. But I suspect that you're going to get weird seams and warping and stuff. Um, someone very smart might be able to do the maths, but I'm not that, that person. But yeah, to do a single one. It's yes, not single one is not true. too hard, um, but to do tiling, I, I don't know where you would start with that. It would be very, I think it would be difficult. It would be really good though. It would be an amazing endeavor. Time for one more question. Uh, maybe this gentleman called Hamish. Or What's the one map you wish would have made it but didn't? Uh, rivers, uh, clean, uh, river health. Um, that's the map that that's my 3 a.m. map where I like was awake just going oh I really should have a map around the health of New Zealand rivers because especially at the time there's so much in the news and I really tried and I just was too 
dim to understand like yeah the next one and and I also was like I knew that there were even people I even know the names of some of the people that I could have reached out to but I just got to it too late and I knew and it was just going to be it was really hard it was hard and I didn't know cartographically how to do it let alone kind of how to interpret the data but yeah clean rivers is wish I wish I wish I'd done